Paul didn't write his letters. Did you know that? He used a scribe, dictated him. He's pacing around the room, dictating him to a scribe. The scribe would write him down. That's whose hands we see here. These are not Paul's hands. Paul was a young man, maybe 40s, 50s, something in there. So imagine now Paul striding around the room, waving his hands, speaking from his heart while this scribe tries to keep up with him. Here we go. This letter is from Paul, an apostle, sent not by men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is any other gospel. Apparently, some people are throwing you into confusion. They're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if even we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than what we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse from the law. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Or of God? Or am I now trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of a human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by a revelation from Jesus Christ. You've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my own people. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God was set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, he was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. I did not consult with any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. I went to Arabia and later turned to return to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and I stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother, and I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches in Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. He who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I, oh, I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation from a prophet and I was meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. You know, I wanted to be sure that I wasn't running in vain or hadn't run my race in vain. Yet, you know what? Not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who are in high esteem, whatever they are makes no difference. God doesn't show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. 
On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching to the Gentiles, the gospel, to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been sent to the circumcised. For the God who was at work in Peter with the circumcised was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, James, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked is that we should remember the poor as we were always eager to do. That's why we brought the contribution to the church from Antioch. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. He stood condemned before... Before certain people came down from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when he, they arrived, he, he drew back and separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision party. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Can you imagine? So, When I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I had to challenge Peter in front of them all. I said, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then you're going to force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the Gentile sinners, does it mean Christ made us sinners? Hello? No, absolutely not. I mean, I mean, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained by the law, then Christ died for nothing. It was pointless. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ Jesus was clearly portrayed, publicly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish that after beginning by means of the Spirit, you are now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, okay? It was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced this gospel in advance to Abraham saying, all nations will be blessed through you. All nations. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything 
written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. But Christ redeemed us from that curse of the law. You see? He became a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so in this case, the promise that was spoken to Abraham and to his seed, and the scripture doesn't say, and to seeds, but to, meaning many people, but to your seed, that means one person who's Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later cannot set aside the covenant previously established by God. It doesn't happen like that. Because then it does away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise to Abraham. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. You getting this? Why then was the law given at all, you might say, if we don't have to obey it? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law given through angels and entrusted to a mediator, well, yeah, a mediator implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God that he gave to Abraham? Does it cancel it? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness certainly would have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe it. Before coming to this faith, we were held under custody, under the law. We were locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed, like we were in jail or something. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. But now that this faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So now there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise given to Abraham. What I'm saying is that if an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we, we were in slavery too, under the elemental spiritual forces of this world. But when the time set by the Father had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, because you're sons, God has sent his Spirit into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So, you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who are not gods. 
But now that you know God, or, or rather are known by God, how is it you're turning back? You're turning back to those weak and miserable forces. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you somehow that I've wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me because I became like you. Oh, no, you did me no wrong. As you know, it's because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you, even though my illness was a trial for you. And you didn't treat me with contempt or scorn then. Instead, you welcomed me as if I was an angel of God. I mean, as if I was Christ himself. Where, where then is your blessing for me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. I want to be zealous always, but not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, whom I'm again in pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law. Aren't you aware of what the law says? Don't, don't you know what it says? Well, it's written that Abraham had two sons. One by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. The son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. His son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. Now, um, I'm taking these things figuratively, okay? The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. That's Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children under the law. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child, shout for joy, cry aloud. You were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, are like Isaac, the children of the promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the spirit. It's the same now. Nothing has changed. What does the scripture say, though? It says, get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son shall never share the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not of the slave woman, but of the free woman. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Don't let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words. Listen to this. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself get circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again. I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope in Christ Jesus. Oh, come on. 
In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision have any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself oh, through love. Oh, you were running a good race. Who cut in to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. You know, a little yeast works through a whole batch of dough, doesn't it? All right. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing into you into confusion, whoever that may be, they'll have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? It makes no sense. In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, ah, I wish they'd go the whole way and castrate themselves. My brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. But Now listen, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another and humbly in love. The entire law is fulfilled in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour each other with this stuff, watch out, you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. So you shouldn't do whatever you want. If you were led by the Spirit, you see, you're not under the law anymore. The acts of the flesh, oh, you know, they're obvious Sexual immorality and impurity and debauchery and idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and discord and jealousy and fits of rage and selfish ambition and dissensions and factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and I could go on, but you know. I warn you, as I did before, that people who live like this, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit that's within you That's love and and joy and peace and forbearance with one another and kindness and goodness and faithfulness oh, and gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with those passions and desires. And since we live with the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited. Come on. Provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore them, but but do it gently. Watch yourself. You may also be tempted. Oh, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they're something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test his own actions and they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry his own load. Nevertheless, I guess the one who, this is true, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all things with their instructor. Now listen, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, the flesh will reap destruction from it. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. (laughs) Yeah, now, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. 
Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. And the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. That's it. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised so they can boast about your circumcision in the flesh. That's all this is. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Yeah, neither circumcision or uncircumcision mean anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me any trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen.